This is Spencer with The MacGuffin, and today I'm joined by Matthew Heinemann, who is the director, producer, any number of jobs on the documentary Cartel Land, uh, a film which is sort of discussing the, I guess it's, it's touching upon the war on drugs, but it's bigger than that. It's sort of dealing with a response to the war on drugs from citizens as opposed to government institutions. Um, I wanted to start with a general question of how did you decide to work on this film and how you decide, once you decide to work on it, how you went about gaining the access you did, because it's a pretty very inside the wall kind of documentary, so to speak. Yeah. I, so my last film, uh, Skate Fire, was a film on healthcare in the U.S., and it's a film I'm very proud of. Um, it's sort of about how and why our healthcare system is, is broken and what we can do to fix it. And I, I really wanted to make a film that was much more immersive, much more um, sort of on-the-ground, uh, character-driven film. And I was riding the subway in New York, and I read this Rolling Stone article by Damon Tabor called Border Madness uh, about these Arizona vigilantes, um, and the minute I read it, I, I, I knew it was a film that I wanted to make. Uh, I knew very little about border security. I knew very little about um, the war on drugs, uh, the world of vigilantism. And so I set about gaining access to that story. And then after filming with Tim Naylor Foley and, and his men uh, on the Arizona side, my father actually sent me an article about the auto defensas and Mitchell Khan. Uh, about a citizen group who had risen up to fight back against the Knights nice Templar cartel. And again, the minute I read that, I knew I wanted to create this sort of parallel narrative of vigilantism on both sides of the border fighting the same common enemy. I mean, it's a, fa you're, it's a fascinating topic. Um, what made you decide you wanted to do it in one film? I mean, obviously, there's a way you can sort of have the parallel narratives, but it almost felt like both subjects were so rich and so deep that they, especially the Mexico one, they could have easily been like, you know, a three hour documentary unto itself, I would imagine. It seems like uh, that could have been a logistic challenge just trying to make that into one film. Yeah, it was, it was very difficult, you know, cutting the film um, and, and, and making these two storylines work together. But I think in the end, uh, it really um, allows us to sort of play off of the idea of vigilantism, um, you know, and. As I said, in many ways, it's a, it's a character-driven film about two men, two 55-year-old men, um, both who believe that the government has failed them, both who have taken the law into their own hands to fight for what they believe in. But the, the circumstances are quite different. And so, you know, in Mexico, the violence is ex incredibly real. You know, 80,000 people so have been killed control, since yeah. 2007. 20,000-plus people disappeared. Uh, in Arizona, that, that we obviously are not seeing that violence. Um, but there's a fear there um, amongst Naylor and his men that this violence is coming across our border. And so, I, you know, I, I find it both, uh, you know, in very intellectually interesting comparison. Um, and, I, and obviously, uh, you know, I wanted to play on the duality of, of the U.S. and Mexico, given that, you know, we are responsible in the U.S. for the war that is happening in Mexico. We are feeding that war. We are funding that war. Um, we are consuming the drugs that are the uh, basis of that war. Actually, that was one of the most interesting things to me was when uh, you were interviewing the drug cartel, or whatever it is at that point, whatever iteration, because it mutates so much. Um, and they're like, look, you know, if we had alternatives, we know this is like an evil thing. We wouldn't be doing it. It's so interesting to me to sort of have a concept of like a drug dealer, sort of like um, a... I don't know, not a, necessarily a bad person because it's so vilified, but you think about the circumstances in Mexico and it's sort of like, in a lot of ways, they have been forced into those sort of circumstances. Um, the duality of the, the vigilantism is a very interesting thing and kind of, in some ways, scary when you see the ultimate evolution of these groups from, you know, um, I don't know what you want to describe as like a snake eating itself or something like that, where it initially starts out with this very beautiful um, uprising to fight it back against these people who are just killing and raping and murdering all these these individuals but um, eventually it eats itself from the inside is that something that you think about in terms of the context of the American side as well though like there's a moment at the end where they're sort of lamenting what's a big 
occurred in Mexico, and then you cut to the American side, and it's like, how much do we need to worry about this as those groups continue to rise in prevalence and as they gain more members and stuff like that? Was that something that you thought about as you were sort of tail ending this film? How much do we need to worry? Sorry, uh, so, like you know, like Auto Defensa grew and grew and grew, and ultimately, in essence, becomes part of the problem and part of the cartel and part of the government. But the 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 border groups that we have on our side, like initially, they're very vigilante. Like, I mean, initially, I'm not like someone who went into this film is like I don't really feel a lot of comfort in thinking about these groups. But initially, it's like shocking how little sort of consciousness we have about the border area but as they grew and grew in size it cuts from them uh i think it's morella is talking about autofensa you know essentially and the parallel comes from the you know absolute power le- or was it absolute power leads to absolute corruption or whatever the quote is uh, absolute power corrupts absolutely okay, exactly and it is sort of you you cut to these groups that are growing in numbers on our side of the border and it's like is this something you know we actually should be concerned about as these non-governmental organizations are, whether they start out initially with good vigilante um, uh, concepts, whether what this ultimately might evolve to be, I guess. It's a really difficult question for me to answer. I, you know, I, I I can only answer what I what I've seen and, okay, and, 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 and what, you, what, what, what you've seen. What I've seen is what you've seen. Ha, so. Has your perspective about these vigilante groups along the border changed since you started working on this film? I I I, I don't really think my perspective matters, honestly. Um, I, I'm not a big fan of agenda filmmaking. You know, I'm not a big fan of having a thesis and sort of finding characters and storylines and ideas that sure. fulfill your thesis. You know, to me, the beauty of documentary film is that you can shed light on an issue that people don't know about or, or get, gain access to a world that people don't see. And that's really what I tried to do with this film is gain access to characters and people in a world that we sort of see in the headlines, but we've never really sort of experienced. And so that's, that's what I was trying to do. Um, as far as, you know, prescribing the future, you know, I can't pretend like I have the expertise or the knowledge to be able to do that. What is it like um, as you follow the evolution of the auto fence? So it seemed like you had stuff pretty much there from the beginning of this organization that seem to take a good portion of Mexico over in their um, um, in their campaign. Were you very conscious of the corruption that was traveling through the organization as the documentary was gone? And if so, was that something that concerned you as a filmmaker? Not necessarily in the sense of what that would do to the documentary, but in terms of your own personal safety or what it meant to try and actually cover this in a uh, safe manner. So, you know, I, I'm not a war reporter. I've never been in situations like that. You know, I've never been in shootouts. I've never been in meth labs. Um, so I found myself in this film in, you know, very difficult places, uh, you know, as well as my, you know, crew that, that was with me. Um, an amazing small crew of people that I had with me. Um, I think what fascinated me was I originally thought I was telling this very simple story of, uh, you know, guys in white shirts fighting against white guys in black hats in this sort of sort of classic Western sense. And slowly over time, I realized that the story is much more complicated, much more gray. And that complexity really drove me, really, really sort of fascinated me. And, and I really wanted to try to understand what was really happening. And it was very difficult because, you know, the, the allegiances within these groups were changing, you know, every week. Um, it's very, very hard to tell, who, you know, whether I was with the good guys or the bad guys. You know, I could be on an operativo in Mexico in the back of a truck, and I literally would not know if I was with the good guys or the bad guys. You know, and that was very scary, obviously. Um, I don't know if that answers your no, question. No, no, it's perfect. And it yeah. sort of touched upon, what was the question is like, as a filmmaker, obviously you want to get to the truth. Is there any thought to le- legality of what's going on? Not necessarily like, oh, I'm a drug dealer now, but like if, for instance, something were to occur and you're in Mexico and like <laughs> there's a whole barrel of meth next to you, like it, did you have any sort of strategy for how to keep yourself 
legally safe as this is all going on. Not necessarily like physically safe, because obviously that's dependent upon other people, but um, just to protect yourself while also keeping you honest and objective about the subject. We spoke to a number of lawyers and nonprofits going to the film, um, knowing that we'd be in um, filming amongst people who are either doing flat out illegal things or, or, or walking along you know, the tightrope of legality. And so, um, you know, as journalists, we are there observing. We are not partaking in the activities. We are, we are there observing them, them. And so I think, you know, as long as we maintain that line, um, we are well within our bounds to, you know, gain access to the things that we gained access to. Which, I mean, you did a phenomenal job. In terms of that all, was there any, and maybe this speaks to just your experience in Mexico, um, in terms of like the corruption, the systemic corruption, was it concerning even hearing that information, not knowing you know who you could trust in the government, and how did you approach interactions with the government for this movie, or did you just avoid it altogether? U.S. or Mexican? Mexican specifically. So um, I'm more scared of the Mexican government than I am of the cartels, honestly. Yeah, and no, and we you know. We received a threat near the end of the film, um, saying that they're to watch our back and that they're tracking my phone and my email, as well as that of some of my local crew. Um, so, you know, it'll be interesting to see what happens when we when we release the film in Mexico, uh, which we hope to do in, in mid July in theaters uh, around the same time we open in theaters here in, in the states. Uh, so, I'm 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 very much looking forward to seeing how both the people of Mexico react to the film, as well as, obviously, the government. I think you did a great job in terms of creating a 3D portrait of something like, for instance, on the American side, to hear them supporting the rebels of the Auto Defensa in their uprising, as well as having somebody like Dr. Morales, who is clearly a flawed character as the film goes on. Like, he might be pushing a good agenda, but he's personally got some uh, characteristic issues. Um, was it difficult to try and keep everyone as sort of like a balanced, non-two-dimensional uh, per person for the film? Because it seems like it'd be very easy to be like, oh, these defense people on the American side are whack jobs, or those, those Mexican rebels are like the heroes of the movie or something like that. It seems like it could be very easy to boil different people down to like good or bad where it felt like everyone was a different shade of gray. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, I never intended to make a very simplistic portrait. You know, I knew that these were complex people doing complex things and the comp I could never imagined how complex things actually were. And so, you know, I, 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 I didn't want to, especially with the doctor, you know, create this very um, one dimensional, two dimensional portrait uh, of him, I wanted to show um, both his, you know, strengths and, and his weaknesses, and you know, I commend him for allowing me to sort of show both sides of, of who he is. Uh, in terms of like being with him, like clearly he becomes a pretty prominent target as the film goes on. Was there any sort of legit serious concern about your safety? I mean, being in the firefights and stuff like that, you know, that's dangerous as well. But if somebody is like an assassination target, did that alter your approach to documenting around him yeah i mean he, you know he had a target on his back for for much of the film and even just driving the car with him was scary you know at, at any point you were with him it was scary because you knew that there are people that didn't want him around whether it's the government whether it's the other cartels whether there's people, people within his own yeah. pe you know his own group so you know it was very frightening to even just be around him um as well you know i think you know any point during the film in Mexico, we always had our antennas up at all times uh, because, you know, they're very real situations. So the film is Cartel Land. Uh, is there a website about it or is there any release information you can share? So the, yeah, the, our website's cartellandmovie.com or you can find us on Facebook, facebook.com slash cartelland. It's being released uh, in July 3rd in New York, July 10th in LA, and then nationwide on July 17th. Fantastic. And in terms of you personally, do you have a Twitter or anything that people can keep up to date with you? Or is there anything else you want people to know that you're working on? Um, I mean, my Twitter is at Matt Heineman, uh, but I never tweet. Um, <laughs> I'm working on, a, I'm developing a few different projects right now and I'm excited to 
bring them to the world soon, hopefully. So. Fantastic. Well, good luck with Cartel Lane. I can't wait to see what you do next. Thank you so much.